Hello, we're joined here today by Paul Graham. He's the head of dental at Christie & Co, who have just released their business outlook report for 2023. Paul, thank you for joining us. Thanks, James. Thanks for having me on. Brilliant. So I wanted to start, first of all, you release this report every year. I remember last year, the report coming out and we spoke to you on our podcast at the time. Uh, for those who may not know, could you tell, them, uh, tell us a little bit about what Christie & Co's business outlook report actually is and, and what it looks at? Yeah, certainly. Um, it's a report that we produce across all the sectors that we operate within, um, specifically in dental. It gives us a moment to reflect on 2022, um, track the stats that came from the market in that time and our predictions for the year ahead as well. Fantastic. So obviously 2022 is quite an interesting one. So looking back over the past year with this 2023 report, uh, obviously, 2022, we saw uh, kind of at the end to the COVID restrictions um, mm. that have a positive impact on the dental market. Or was the dental market relatively, I guess, kind of OK during that period in terms of you know, kind of practice sales? And Yeah, yeah, good question. It, it was a moment where we were kind of reflecting at the, the end of last year and, and then remembering to ourselves that we actually had in January 2022, effectively a lockdown, the, the stipulation to work from home because of Omicron um, variant at that time. And that feels like a distant memory, but, but it, it, in, in the fact that it was last year, and you could almost kind of write that month off, um, it was a bit of a kind of false start to the year. It was actually nice and really encouraging to see how the rest of the year developed. I know there was a lot of hurdles and challenges in that time as well, and especially the the, the, the war in Russia and Ukraine when nobody could predict that that was going to escalate the way it did. Um, but the momentum coming from 2021 into 2022 was definitely there from a, a, the perspective of dental sales and the transactions that were taking place. Um, and, and even the economic challenges that we were faced in the second half of last year, um, there was enough momentum in the market to get us through that um, and, and I suppose when you look at the kind of political and eco economic landscape and, and UK government, especially, we were seeing we were seeing changes that were happening within the space of two months that would usually take four years otherwise, or perhaps longer. I mean, it was just a, a, a fairly frantic and hectic time. Um, the market was definitely in a, in a state of flux, a state of shock watching what was going on. But despite all of that, 2022 was our strongest ever year on record. So I take it you're alluding to the kind of mini budget, as it was called, uh, but during Liz Truss's time as prime minister. Yeah, mini, mini budget, um, three prime ministers later. Um, yeah, all, all of these good things. Um, I, I, I think... Uh, did, did it have an impact? Yes, it, it did. I think the market's become a little bit more cautious. Um, there's a bit of a, a recalibration going on. But I think one of the statements that I referenced throughout the, the Business Outlook 2023 review in Dental, it's far from doom and gloom. Um, I know there's been some wild predictions about the market crashing, uh, multiples coming down, values coming down. Um, I, I think... Like that's coming from those with a bit of a vested interest in acquiring practices. So it's the nature of the beast, really. Um, but, but, but we have to kind of focus on the facts. We, we, we see that dentistry, despite the operational challenges in NHS, um, the, the, the increase in private revenue, private practices still having some of their best weeks and months ever on record. Um, there is demand from buyers and, and banks are lending to the sector as well. So, there's corporate consolidation at the top slice, those, those large profitable um, practices that make economic sense to be a fully associate-led practice. They tend to be of a certain value that will hone in on who's capable of a purchase that size, and it tends to be the, the corporate operators. Um, that's, that's very active. But then that layer below um, dominates the transactional activity. We sold over 130 practices last year, 70% of those practices to the independent market. So it was great to see uh, deals happening between dentist to dentist. Wow, okay. So it's, it's not just kind of the biggest slice of the pie. I hate to use that term nowadays, but um, <laughs> that wasn't going just kind of, you know, it wasn't, wasn't the corporate market kind of swallowing everybody up. 
No, I mean, it, I think there's it's a misconception in the market. Um, corporates are very specific about what they want to buy. And even more so now, they'll, they'll take a real kind of microscopic view on what business is right for their portfolio. Um, it has to be of a certain size, quality, scale, um, having the incumbent principle tied in typically. Um, and, and, and yeah, they're very selective. So there's not, I mean, if you kind of look at the mass market, 12,500 practices throughout the UK, clearly um, that type of criteria will be for the minority of practices that are available. So it, it, it's really, uh, really fantastic to see the transactional market being dominated by, by independents. Brilliant. So, I mean, what effect is the cost of living crisis? I mean, I'm trying to think how far back that terminology goes now. I mean, when, when did we enter the cost of living crisis? Um, yeah. Did you have any idea of kind of what month that really kicked in? Or was yeah, it- I mean, I- it, it felt as though it was kind of just on the back of the the uh, Ukraine Russian war, where the, there was all of a sudden just this 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 kind of matter of um, uh, utility costs increasing or supply issues, and then it's really kind of escalated from there, in my opinion. Um, I think there was always this view that um, personnel costs were going to increase, um, but it's gathered momentum. Um, I think it, it should be kind of put into perspective, though. There is a view that even when we look at kind of rising interest rates now, what we've had two, three, four years prior, has that actually been abnormal? Have they been abnormally low rates? Everyone's just got used to it, thought that was the norm, when in reality it's not. There's a bit of a mindset shift. And we've kind of got to look at our businesses now and, and and those buyers who are acquiring them, um, typically banks in the past were stress testing those businesses at the rates that are applied today anyway. So a business that had worked pre-interest rate rises will still work now. And I think this is this is a good thing because we've got we've got practice owners who are selling typically because of retirement. Um, they, 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 they've had 20, 30 years of ownership they want out. Um, the new owner coming in, looking at those businesses, and they're very good businesses. De- those dental practices are profitable. Um, patient care is at the front and centre of those businesses. But there's opportunities for those buyers who are acquiring to make them better. Um, they're, they're not maxed out in any shape or form. There's, there's opportunities to make them more efficient. Um, rising costs can be counteracted by a more streamlined view of running that business. That's That's not cutting costs back in terms of personnel or, or associate rates, but actually looking at better deals for labs, materials, um, utility costs we know are rising, but how, how can these businesses that are having a, a squeeze on um, those, those rising utilities counteract it by, by introducing further revenue streams, for example? So it's really, really quite, you know, in my opinion, I think quite interesting to see those who are coming into the sector just now who are actually taking a very good business to become an even better business. And I think that that trend is going to continue. Quite right, interesting. So you've kind of half answered my, my next question, which was about interest rates and kind of, I guess, whether the after effect from them kind of, I mean, they obviously they, they rose a lot quicker, you know, it was a much sharper curve than it should have been, I, I guess, uh, with, with that mini budget um, back in the autumn. I mean, you know, did, I mean, did that kind of, I mean, was there, did it play into the, how the market was performing at all? Did it kind of stall completely for a bit or did, did everything kind of carry on business as usual? Um, it, it was probably, I would say business as usual was perhaps just a bit too extreme. Extreme. There was definitely a couple of, couple of kind of fine, bit, a bit of fine tuning going on between the deals that we were doing, the buyer appetite. They were definitely being kind of more, the due diligence going into the, 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 the practice that they're acquiring, they wanted to make sure it was more viable, it was being stress tested, it was definitely going to work. And, and you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, I think this has uh, been an opportunity for existing practice owners as well to improve their businesses whilst they, they recognise that um, things were perhaps becoming a little bit more tighter, the squeeze was on. What could those businesses do to counteract that? Um, so 
demand has definitely remained. I think um, we kind of talk about multiples of EBITDA often and buyers can, um, and sellers can become obsessed with multiples, uh, what, what multiple are we paying for this practice? But, but the crucial point is what we're actually multiplying. So the, the due diligence being carried out on, on finding how sustainable that practice profit is, is the crucial part. Multiples will take care of themselves. Multiples have developed because of buyer demand. And, and ultimately, buyer demand is still there. Dentistry is look, it's going through difficult times just now, particularly in the NHS. But, but there's another part of dentistry and, 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 and private dentistry that is absolutely booming just now. So um, those buyers who recognise and lenders who recognise, banks who are supporting these buyers recognize a needs-based business, a healthcare-related business. That's that's always going to be recession-proof. It's always going to perform better than perhaps some of the more um, uh, businesses that, that are elective. Um, and, and I suppose we can kind of hone in on even private dentistry at that point, whilst there's a lot of questions about how sustainable the increase of the, the the boom effect is just now the, the the zoom boom what we're doing just now and and cosmetic dentistry increasing um there's still a question mark around how that's going to perform in the next six to 12 months so i think this is this is an area that, that many of those private operators particularly um the, the the kind of more cosmetic type treatments that are being carried out um will be watching with anticipation to see the trends of of, of the market and, and ultimately the consumer, you and I, the patients out there. So is that, does that come down to perhaps the Zoom boom maybe coming coming to an end as we, we've kind of got out, you know, kind of back out into the world? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think this, this kind of spike and increase that we've seen on the back of the pandemic couldn't continue at that rate forever. So I think if there's a plateau at best, great. I think a lot of these businesses will not want to see a decline in that income. Um, so, so the businesses that we'll see perform better than others who are, who are um, w- working within that private sector and, and doing those treatments will be the practices that are marketing themselves, that continue marketing, um, promoting their, their, their businesses, their personnel behind the businesses. Um, and I think that's really important to continue doing so um not not just accept the fact okay there's a there's a bit of a squeeze on the economy just now and the consumer spend might tighten therefore i'll switch off as well i think these businesses that will set themselves apart from the others will do something a bit different will continue driving the benefits of what that treatment is and and why patients should use them with, obviously, we have NHS contract reforms uh, sort of on the way. I mean, do you, do you see that kind of resulting in more practices taking up NHS contracts, or or more going the other way and going private only? I think, sadly, it's the latter. Um, I think there's, there's there's some fantastic NHS practices out there, typically that have UDA rates in excess of thirty pounds. They can attract dentists that they. they um, they're performing their contracts. Um, there's more of a there's more meat on the bone when you're kind of looking at the the the, the cost of delivery for that NHS work versus the UDA rate that's being paid. Conversely, practices that have a lower than average UDA rate aren't making profit from that. In fact, some will be loss making. I think this is where the 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 the, the trouble is, and the, the real kind of pain is for those NHS practices that they have no other option but to start to diversify. Um, they don't agree with the mechanics of the NHS contract, and the 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 the, the fundamentally the patient care isn't fit for purpose. Is is how it's been perceived. Um, so these businesses will start to diversify and. Um, look to become and convert to a planned practice or fully private practice. And they're doing so successfully just now as well. Um, but that, I, I should caveat, that's, that's not to mean that, uh, and not to say that NHS practices are completely out of favour, no longer in demand. They, they, they still are. Um, 
I mean, having a having an income that's effectively underpinned and and, and secured there as a guaranteed income. Um, and, and as long as it's viable and the performance and the delivery of that contract, there's there's no issues there. Those those practices are still going to be in high demand. Okay, so to kind of wrap things up, I wanted to ask you about your market predictions for the year ahead. I know the report touches on some predictions for 2023 as well. Could you talk us mm. through? Yeah, so the predictions for 2023, um, you know, these have been formed because of a great 2022 and it's not been a tale of two halves. We've had a very strong first half in, in 2022 and equally a very strong second half. So the momentum is going to continue. Um, Christine Co um, valued, sold and advised on over £1.3 billion worth of dental practice value in 2022. Um, so we're not going to see that just cut off straight away. Um, uh, far from it. Uh, we look at the deal pipeline just now going into 2023, and I think we're on for another record year. But if we look at the, the demand and the buyer profile just now and, and what's being acquired, there is still this momentum that private practices are in high demand. NHS practices that have performance issues are having a, a, a negative impact on pricing, particularly where it was previously. NHS practices that have a higher than average UDA rate and performing very well are still in high demand. So there's a real microscopic view on, on the performance of a practice more than ever before now. Um, I think the other challenge is that um, the market's going to face, and it's it's well publicised, is the personnel uh, matters just now, finding good nurses, retaining good nurses, and then clinical staff as well. Associates are are in short supply. You know, we, 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 I think the market needs to find a way, the profession needs to find a way to attract new blood and, and good dentists back into the sector. Um I think that will be a challenge as we go through 2023. I think where it's reassuring is that that is within every sector, there's there's retention staff issues and, and so dentistry is not just contained on its own. I think that that gives a little bit of reassurance there that that this is a this is a economy matter, not just an industry matter. Um uh, but generally speaking, I think we're going to see a, a, a strong 2023. I, I think those practice owners who are considering selling should take early advice um, and not just get to a point of we want out now. You know, early planning is crucial. And I think particularly when the market and the, the buyers out there and the advisors are taking the time and viewing practices in a much more microscopic way, um, it's important to reflect that with being absolutely prepared in a practice sale. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate you coming on to speak with us today. Um, Pleasure. Make sure to kind of link uh, to kind of to Christie's website and to the Business Outlook report as well. Um, so everyone watching or listening can find that in the episode description. But you know, once again, thank you very much, Paul. It's always a pleasure to have you on here. Thanks very much, James. My pleasure.